Hello, my name is Jeff Harris, and I'm a principal engineer here at MuleSoft. Today, I'd like to congratulate you. You picked the right session. You're going to find out how to connect the Commodore 64 from 1982 to the internet. I assume you've read this before. So let's get into it. So your first question is probably why. Why on earth would we want to do something so silly, so pointless? The answer is, I work at MuleSoft, and we work on integrating anything. In fact, that is our tagline. We say we can connect anything. Some really, really smart marketing people came up with that tagline. But hands up, which engineers trust marketing taglines? Not me. We wanted to prove this thing out. And so as part of a hackathon project, we decided we want to try and really connect anything. I actually read an article uh, from someone who was working on an Atari console trying to build a Hello World application. And it kind of sparked my interest in retro computing. And I wanted to try and use MuleSoft to connect some retro computer. And we picked the Commodore 64. And why not? The Commodore 64 was the most sold computer of all time. It sold 17 million units back in the 80s. It was better at graphics. It was better at audio than other computers. It was cheaper. Everyone likes cheap things that are really good. And a Commodore 64 was all of that. There's another reason why we picked the Commodore. Commodore has some amazing adverts. And they're all on YouTube now. You can check them all out. And we did. And here are some of the best ones. These guys were so ahead of their time. They were doing pair programming in 1982. But even before Instagram, these guys were selling the Commodore lifestyle. Look at this guy. Is that a happy engineer? Maybe he's an executive. It's hard to tell. And with Commodore, everyone's a winner. You might not be able to read the text here, but it says, even if you didn't get picked for the Olympics, you can just stay at home in your bedroom with your Commodore and play games on your Commodore instead. That's great. Everyone's included. And here's a classic one from an advert called Everyone Keep Up With A Commodore. And this is state of the art. This is what they wanted people to look like when they use the Commodore. Isn't that great? So we have picked our Commodore. We want to use it. It's a great computer. It's got great adverts. But we want to connect it to something. That something is going to be the internet. Now, this picture is obviously not drawn to exact scale. But I think it gives the right impression. We have the Commodore on one side. It can do very, very little. It has only 64K of memory. It has one megahertz CPU. It was never designed to operate with anything like the modern internet. And on the right-hand side, we have the internet, which is a gargantuan thing full of TLS, JSON, YAML, CSS. There is no way that these two things can interoperate. It's safe to say that there are some implementation challenges here that we don't really know how we're going to get around. In fact, only if we had some sort of tooling, something that would make this easier. Of course, we do. MuleSoft is in the business of working with integration. We connect legacy devices to the internet day in, day out. So why don't we use MuleSoft to connect this Commodore to the computer, to the internet? And that's what we did. So let's take a step further into the, the machine. We know we can figure out the cloud side. That's kind of easy. We can figure out with MuleSoft. We can figure out JSON. But how about actually inside the Commodore? This is a machine that's 37 years old now. Does anyone even know how to write code for this? So I, I have two favorite things about this whole project. This is one of them, and I'll share the other one uh, in a little bit. Every single brand new Commodore 64 that got sold came with this programmer's reference guide. And this thing is like a weighty book. Right? It, it contains incredibly exhaustive specs of every chip that's in the Commodore, every software, every bit of hardware, and how to use it. I had to replace my MacBook a couple of months ago. And it came with like a three-page booklet, basically on how to 
plug the power in. Yeah, things have changed. I love that you buy this computer and you get the programmer's guide with it. Like, you're supposed to program it. Isn't that cool? And nowadays, of course, it's all online. People have converted it to a text file. So if you're on the train and you want to do some coding, you have this one text file that tells you everything you need to know. It's awesome. So if you're going to program a Commodore 64, the first thing you need to understand is that there is very, very little abstraction between you and the hardware. In fact, half the time, there's no abstraction at all. So you need to understand what hardware it is that you're dealing with. There are like 19 points here. I'm only going to go through four. So the first one, this one's called the serial port. This is what you use to connect a Commodore 64 to the outside world. We're going to use that. The next one, this is your CPU. This is the 1 megahertz 6502 CPU. It's the same one that got used in the Nintendo uh, game system. The sound chip. This is one of the reasons why there were 17,000 games written for the Commodore. The sound chip gave way better audio than any other computer out there. And this is the VIC chip, which is the graphics chip. And again, it's the reason why 17,000 games were created for this. So you had two options back in 1980, or even today, when you want to write code for a Commodore. You can use BASIC, or you can use machine code. BASIC is great for doing really simple things. You can kind of get something going, but it's slow. It's slow and it's horrible. If you want to do fun stuff like animations, sound, audio, you basically want to make something like a game, you need to jump right in and go to machine code. We want all of those things, so we're going to jump into machine code. It's not really that much different from coding, honestly, in a high-level language. You just get less. You get to do things like loading and storing memory. You get to do if statements, kind of. You get to do function calls, kind of. Basically, you start off very simple, and it gets really, really complex really quickly. But it can be done. The other thing that the Commodore gives you is the Commodore 64 kernel. Now, it kind of sounds like to us in modern day that the kernel is the operating system for the Commodore. It's kind of not. It's more of a library. When the Commodore boots, it boots into the basic interpreter, and that's really all you get. The kernel gives you a bunch of really useful functions, but you have to call them. Your code has to call them. And the only documentation is in the programmer's reference. And to really use these functions, you basically need to know where they are in memory and jump to that location in memory. It's all completely hard-coded. And there's actually kind of a funny story behind the spelling of kernel. In, all the, in the reference guide and all of the software, kernel is spelled with an A. And the reason it's spelled with an A and not an E like we do today is that back in when Commodore was building the earlier machine to this, one of the engineers, his notebook, he wrote kernel the wrong way. He wrote it with an A. And when the technical docs guys came to write the programmer's guide for that earlier computer, they simply copied and pasted what he had, and it became kernel with an A. And so Commodore never changed that afterwards. But it was all just a spelling mistake. It happens, I guess, in the 80s. I don't know. So we talked about 17,000 games. Commodore has a bunch of different graphics modes, and I'm just going to talk about three of them. So hardware sprites is a way that we can do animation and moving without having to copy pixel data. Remember, we have a 1 megahertz CPU. It's really slow. You can't copy pixels. So instead, games use these sprites, which you can move around really quickly. In the example here on the right-hand side, I wrote a little application that can render a GIF, and it uses hardware sprites. And so instead of writing the pixels every time, we basically tell the, the video chip, here's the sprite data, just go and do your thing. So let's look at now text mode. So text mode in Commodore assembly language is kind of simple, kind of not. I'm not going to go through every line here. I just want to give you just a couple of like really, like this is literally code that will execute on the Commodore. This would compile and work. This will do nothing but print a string. And so basically, you define the string, and you loop around every single character until you hit a 0, and then you exit the loop. And if you execute that code on the Commodore, what you'll see is this. The first five or six lines are the traditional Commodore boot sequence, followed by hello trailhead dx. That's our code. Let's make it more complicated. 
Let's say we want to do something as simple as using color for the font. Well, now you need to know that the Commodore has a section of RAM called the color RAM. And you need to know that it's stored in location OXD800. You need to know that it is 1,000 bytes long. And you need to know the correct values to poke into that color RAM. So let's say you've done that. And all of this stuff is in the programmer's guide again, because that tells you everything you need to know. Now you get color text. So you can see how it starts off really simple. And we just ramp the complexity slightly. And over time, it gets more and more and more complex. So bitmap mode is the, the third kind of graphics mode that we're going to talk about. So we can switch the Commodore into this thing called bitmap mode, where every single bit now, not byte, but bit, contains a single pixel. And if you've seen our Commodore demo over in the integration section, this is what we use to display photos. So this photo here is 8,000 bytes. It's one bit per pixel. And we can choose the foreground color and the background color. So if we put all those things together, we end up with our screen that, we, that you might have seen at the demo. At the top, where we have number one, that sliding effect is just caused by us writing different values into color RAM. And we change those colors every single frame. And if you, do, if you write the things in the right way, it looks like it's sort of scrolling the image. Number two, it looks like an image, but actually it's just uh, ASCII art. So Commodore has a whole bunch of uh, custom ASCII graphics that you can use. And one of our designers used those to, to make these pictures. And number three and number four, these are using hardware sprites. So every single frame, we increment either the frame counter or the animation uh, x axis for the, the mule. And that's how you see the mule running across the screen and the bird sort of flapping its wings. So that's how we render stuff to the screen. But if you remember, we're talking about connecting this thing to the internet. So to read bytes from the internet, the Commodore has this thing called the RS-232 port. And if you write the correct assembly language, you can tell the Commodore to open this port. And this is how we do it here. Again, I'm not going to go through each line, but this is literally the code that we've written to do this. Once you've opened the device, you can then read from the serial port. Here, we're trying to read a single byte. And if we do this enough times and we read enough bytes, eventually we'll print out that image that you see on the screen. So I said I was going to talk about my two favorite things. This one is actually my, my second favorite. And it's, uh, there's a magazine called this Transactor Magazine from 1989 in February. And they published this article called Trouble Free 240 Board uh, for your Commodore. And the problem that we had, because we're trying to display image data, it takes 30 seconds already to, to transmit the data. We want to run it as fast as, it, as we can. But it, if we run the serial port at 2400 board, we got these weird dropped bytes. Things were corrupted. It didn't always work. Back in 1989, they figured this out. And what actually they did is this guy wrote an article, and he wrote code that we can copy and paste today that patches the system routines for the RS-232 port to fix these bugs. And literally, at a previous conference, you know, we were scratching our heads trying to figure out what this problem was. Somehow I came across this article. Someone else had already OCR'd it into text format. I literally copied and pasted this assembly code into our solution, it compiled the thing, copied it onto the Commodore, ran it, and it fixed our problems. And I was just blown away because this thing that was written in 1989 is now helping us in 2017, 18. Yeah, last year it was. That was cool. That was my second favorite thing. So with what we've got now, we can now write characters to the screen, we can render pixel art, and we can read and write bytes to the serial port. We basically have all the, the building blocks now to build our photo booth. Except for one thing. The Commodore is just sitting there. It has no Ethernet jack. It has no way to connect to the internet. What we did is we built our own cable for it. So there are a whole bunch of Commodore 64 websites still around there. People are still doing this stuff. And if you buy the right pieces from the right places on the internet, and you solder it in the right way and not the wrong way, which we did many times, got it the wrong way around, you eventually end up with this cable which plugs one end into the Commodore, 
and one end plugs into a Raspberry Pi. And it ends up looking like this. And at that point, then on the Raspberry Pi, it looks like you just have a random serial port you can talk to. And on the Commodore side, you can read those bytes coming in. So we have the Commodore side sort of figured out. What does it look like for the internet side? So first of all, on the internet side, we run a Mule application inside of Cloud Hub, which is MuleSoft's cloud hosted environment. This Cloud Hub application can do many things. It can pull data from Twitter. It can read weather information. It exposes an API to receive photos, which you guys would have seen at the demo. And then it can compress those complicated inputs full of JSON and nested objects into a simple protocol that the Commodore can understand. We then put that message onto any point MQ. And this is a message queue that, uh, that connects the cloud side to the Raspberry Pi. Now on the Raspberry Pi, we run Mule again. We have a runtime in the cloud. We have a runtime on the Pi. This is now pulling those items off the queue and then sends those across the serial port to the Commodore, which then boots up the assembly language that we've been looking at and decides whether it should render it to the screen. So basically, that, that's the flow in a nutshell. On the, between, the Commodore, sorry, between the Raspberry Pi and the Commodore, this is what the control flow looks like. Now remember, that the cloud side is unlimited amount of CPU. So things can happen there really quickly. On the Commodore side, we have very low CPU. So things take a long, long time. So we did a, a command response pair where we send some data to the Commodore. And then we stop and wait for an acknowledgment from the Commodore before we let it go again. And using something like AnyPoint MQ or really any message queue makes this really easy because you can hold all the data in the, in the control plane and just pull it down one by one as you need it. So the Mule application is, uh, uh, is based up of a bunch of different flows. Here is an example flow which we pull from Twitter. So we're pulling streaming data from Twitter, and we transform that big, complicated JSON blob from Twitter directly into something that the Commodore can understand. And we do it with DataWeave, which is Mule's transformation language. And here's an example of uh, the DataWeave transform that, that takes the data from Twitter directly and pumps it into a Commodore command that we can understand. So on line 8, that C64 command, it starts with a 1. 1 is the, the number of our message type for tweets. And then the rest of it is our payload data. And so that, that's it. That's all we need to do to send a very simple string down to the Commodore. And if we put the whole thing together, we end up with a final product, which can um, flash text. It can do hardware sprites. It's connected to a Raspberry Pi. Uh, it can receive image data and switch to bitmap mode and, and print that image. Now here, it's printing a very embarrassing image of me wearing a Mickey Mouse hat, uh, which I'm not going to show you all of. But basically, that's the demo. That's the final product. Um, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy the rest of Trailhead DX.